Part 6 Cosette could not help casting one look toward the grand doll still displayed in the toy shop. Then she rapped. The door opened. The Thenardius appeared with a candle in her hand. Oh, it is you. You little beggar, Lord of Massey. You have taken your time. She's been playing the wench. Madame, said Cosette, trembling. There was a gentleman who was coming to lodge. The Thenardius very quickly replaced her fierce air by her amiable grimace, a change at sight peculiar to innkeepers, and looked for the newcomer with eager eyes. Is it monsieur? said she. Yes, madame, answered the man, touching his hat. Rich travellers are not so polite. This gesture, and the sight of the stranger's costume and baggage, which the Thenardius passed in review at a glance, made the amiable grimace disappear, and the fierce air reappear. She added dryly, Enter, good man. The good man entered. The Thenardiers cast a second glance at him, examined particularly his long coat, which was absolutely threadbare, and his hat, which was somewhat broken, and with a nod, a wink, and a turn of her nose, consulted her husband, who was still drinking with the wagoners. The husband answered by that imperceptible shake of the forefinger, which, supported by a protrusion of the lips, signifies in such a case complete destitution. Upon this, the Thenardius exclaimed, Ah, oh, my brave man, I'm very sorry, but I have no room. Put me where you will, said the man, in the garret, in the stable. I will pay as if I had a room. Forty sous. Forty sous. Well, in advance. Forty sous, whispered Wagner to the Thenardius, but it's only twenty sous. It's forty sous for him replied the Thenardius in the same tone. I don't lodge poor people for less. That is true, added her husband softly. It ruins a house to have this sort of people. Meanwhile, the man, after leaving his stick and bundle on the bench, had seated himself at a table on which Cosette had been quick to place a bottle of wine and a glass. The peddler, who had asked for the bucket of water, had gone himself to carry it to his horse. Cosette had resumed her place under the kitchen table and her knitting. The man, who hardly touched his lips to the wine he had turned out, was contemplating the child with a strange attention. Cosette was ugly. Happy, she might perhaps have been pretty. Cosette was thin and pale. She was nearly eight years old, but one would have hardly thought her six. Her large eyes, sunk in a sort of shadow, were almost put out by continual weeping. The corners of her mouth had that curve of, of habitual anguish, which is seen in the condemned and in the hopelessly sick. Her hands were covered with chilblains. The light of the fire, which was shining upon her, made her bones stand out and rendered her thinness fearfully visible. As she was always shivering, she had acquired the habit of drawing her knees together. Her whole dress was nothing but a rag, which would have excited pity in the summer and which excited horror in the winter. She had on nothing but cotton and that full of holes, not a rag of woolen. Her skin showed here and there, and black and blue spots could be distinguished, which indicated places where the Thenardius had touched her. Her naked legs were red and rough. The hollows under her collarbones would make one weep. The whole person of this child, her gait, her attitude, the sound of her voice, the intervals between one word and another, her looks, her silence, her least motion, expressed and uttered a single idea. Fear. Fear was spread all over her. She was, so to say, covered with it. Fear drew back her elbows against her sides, drew her heels under her skirt, made her take the least possible room, prevented her from breathing more than was absolutely necessary, and became what might be called her bodily habit, without possible variation, except of increase. There was in the depth of her eye an expression of astonishment mingled with terror. This fear was such that on coming in, or where she was, Cosette had not dared to go and dry herself by the fire, but had gone silently to her work. The expression on the countenance of this child of eight was so habitually so sad, and sometimes so tragical, that it seemed at certain moments as if she were in the way of becoming an idiot or a demon. Never, as we have said, had she known what it is to pray. Never had she set foot within a church. How can I spare the time? said the Thenardius. The man in the yellow coat did not take his eyes from Cosette. Oh, you want supper? asked the Thenardius of the traveller. He did not answer. He seemed to be thinking deeply. What is that man? said she between her teeth. 
It is some frightful pauper. He hasn't a penny for his supper. Is he going to pay me for his lodging only? It is very lucky, anyway, that he didn't think to steal the money that was on the floor. The door now opened, and Eponine and Azelma came in. They were really two pretty little girls, rather city girls than peasants, very charming, one with her well-polished auburn tresses, the other with her long black braids falling down her back, and both so lively, neat, plump, fresh, and healthy, that it was a pleasure to see them. They were warmly clad, but with such maternal art that the thickness of the stuff detracted nothing from the coquetry of the fit. Winter was provided against without a facing spring. These two little girls shed light around them. Moreover, they were regnant. In their toilet, in their gaiety, in the noise they made, there was sovereignty. When they entered, the Thenardius said to them in a scolding tone which was full of adoration, Ah, you are here then, you children. They went and sat down by the fire. They had a doll which they turned backward and forward upon their knees with many pretty, pretty prattlings. From time to time, Cosette raised her eyes from her knitting and looked sadly at them as they were playing. Eponine and Azelma did not notice Cosette. To them she was like the dog. These three little girls could not count twenty-four years among them all, and they already represented all human society, on one side envy, on the other disdain. The doll of the Thenardier sisters was very much faded, and very old and broken, and it appeared nonetheless wonderful to Cosette, who had never in her life had had a doll. A real doll to use an expression that all children will understand. All at once, the Thenardius, who was continually going and coming about the room, noticed that Cosette's attention was distracted, and that instead of working, she was busied with the little girls who were playing. Ah, oh, I've caught you, cried she. That is the way you work. I'll make you work with a cowhide, I will. The stranger, without leaving his chair, turned toward the Thenardius. Madame, said he, smiling diffidently. Come on. Let her play. On the part of any traveller, who had eaten a slice of mutton and drunk two bottles of wine at his supper, and who had not the appearance of a horrid pauper, such a wish would have been a command. But that man, who wore that hat, should allow himself to have a desire, and a man who wore that coat should permit himself to have a wish, what was what the Thenardius thought ought not to be tolerated. She replied sharply, She must work, for she eats. I do not support her to do nothing. What is it she is making? said the stranger, in that gentle voice which contrasted so strangely with his beggar's clothes and his porter's shoulders. The Thenardius deigned to answer. Stockings, if you please. Stockings for my little girls who have none worth speaking of. I will soon be going barefooted. The man looked at Cosette's poor red feet and continued. When will she finish that pair of stockings? It will take her at least three or four good days, the lazy thing. And how much might this pair of stockings be worth when it is finished? The Thenardius cast a disdained glance at him. At least thirty sous. Would you take five francs for them? said the man. Goodness, exclaimed a wagoner, who was listening with a hoarse laugh. Five francs, it's a handbag, five bullets. Thenardier now thought it time to speak. Yes, monsieur. If it's your fancy, you can have that pair of stockings for five francs. We can't refuse anything to travellers. You must pay for them now, said the Thenardiess, in her short and peremptory way. I will buy that pair of stockings, answered the man. And, added he, drawing a five-franc piece from his pocket and laying it on the table, I will pay for them. Then he turned toward Cosette. Now your work belongs to me. Play, my child. The wagoner was so affected by the five franc piece that he left his glass and went to look at it. It's so in that's effect, cried he as he looked at it. A regular hind wheel, no counterfeit. Thenardier approached and silently put the piece in his pocket. The Thenardier said nothing to reply. She bit her lips and her face assumed an expression of hatred. Meanwhile, Cosette trembled. She ventured to ask, Madame, is it true? Can I play? Play, said the Thenardius in a terrible voice. Thank you, madame, said Cosette. And while her mouth thanked the Thenardius, all her little soul was thanking the traveller. Thenardier returned to his drink. His wife whispered in his ear, What can that yellow man be? I have seen, answered Thenardier in a commanding tone, millionaires with coats like that. 
Cosette had left her knitting, but she was not yet moved from her place. Cosette always stirred as little as was possible. She had taken from a little box behind her a few old rags and her little lead sword. Eponine and Azelma paid no attention to what was going on. They had just performed a very important operation. They'd caught the kitten. They'd thrown the doll on the floor, and Eponine, the elder, was dressing the kitten, in spite of her mewlings and contortions, with a lot of clothes and red and blue rags. Meanwhile, the drinkers were singing an obscene song, at which they laughed enough to shake the room. Thénardier encouraged and accompanied them. As birds make a nest of anything, children make a doll of no matter what. While Eponine and Azelma were dressing up the cat, Cosette, for her part, had dressed up the sword. That done, she had laid it upon her arm and was singing it softly to sleep. But Thénardier, on her part, approached the yellow man. My husband is right, thought she. It may be Monsieur Lafitte. Some rich men are so odd. She came and rested her elbow on the table at which she was sitting. Monsieur, said she. At this word, Monsieur, the man turned. The Thénardiers had called him before only brave man or good man. You see, Monsieur, she pursued, putting on her sweetest look, which was even still more unendurable than her ferocious manner. I am very willing the child should play. I am not opposed to it. It is well for once, because you are generous, but you see, she is poor, she must work. The child is not yours, then? asked the man. Oh dear, no, monsieur. It is a little pauper that we have taken in through charity, a sort of imbecile child. She must have water on her brain. Her head is big, as you see. We do all we can for her, but we are not rich. We write in vain to her country. For six months we have had no answer. We think that her mother must be dead. Ah, said the man, and he fell back into his reverie. This mother was no great thing, added the Thenardius. She abandoned her child. During all this conversation, Cosette, as if an instinct had warned her that they were talking about her, had not taken her eyes from the Thenardius. She listened. She heard a few words here and there. Meanwhile, the drinkers, all three quarters drunk, were repeating their foul chorus with redoubled gaiety. It was heistly spiced with jest, in which the names of the Virgin and the Child Jesus were often heard. The Thenardius had gone to take her part in the hilarity. Cosette under the table was looking into the fire, which was reflected from her fixed eye. She was again rocking the sort of rag baby she had made, and as she rocked it, she sang in a low voice, My mother is dead. My mother is dead. My mother is dead. At the repeated entreaties of the hostess, the yellow man, the millionaire, finally consented to sup. What will monsieur have? Some bread and cheese, said the man. Decidedly, it is a beggar thought the Thenardius. The revellers continued to sing their songs. The child under the table also sang hers. All at once Cosette stopped. She had just turned and seen the little Thenardier's doll, which they had forsaken for the cat and left on the floor, a few steps from the kitchen table. She let the bundled-up sword, that only half satisfied her, fall, and ran her eyes slowly around the room. The Thenardiess was whispering to her husband and counting some money. Eponine and Azelma were playing with the cat. The travellers were eating or drinking or singing. Nobody was looking at her. She had not a moment to lose. She crept out from under the table on her hands and knees, made sure once more that nobody was watching her, then darted quickly to the doll and seized it. An instant afterwards she was at her place, seated, motionless, only turned in such a way as to keep the doll that she held in her arms in the shadow. The happiness was playing with the doll was so rare to her that it had all the violence of rapture. Nobody had seen her except the traveller who was slowly eating his meagre supper. This joy lasted for nearly a quarter of an hour, but in spite of Cosette's precautions, she did not perceive that one of the doll's feet stuck out, and that in the fire of the fireplace lighted it up very vividly. This rosy and luminous foot, which protruded from the shadow, suddenly caught Azelma's eye, and she said to Eponine, Oh, sister! The two little girls stopped, stupefied. Cosette had dared to take the doll. Eponine got up, without letting go of the cat, went to her mother and began to pull at her skirt. Let me alone, said the mother. What do you want? Mother, said the child. Look there! And she pointed at Cosette. Cosette, wholly absorbed in the ecstasy of her possession, saw and heard nothing else. The face of the Thenardiers assumed the peculiar expression which is composed of the terrible mingled with the commonplace, and which has given this class of woman the name of Furies. 
This time, wounded pride exasperated her anger still more. Cosette had leapt over all barriers. Cosette had laid her hands upon the doll of these young ladies. A Tsarina who had seen a mujik trying on the grand cordon of her imperial son would have had the same expression. She cried with a voice harsh with indignation, Cosette! Cosette shuddered, as if the earth had quaked beneath her. She turned around. Cosette! repeated the Thenardius. Cosette took the doll and placed it gently on the floor with a kind of veneration mingled with despair. Then, without taking away her eyes, she joined her hands, and, what is frightful to tell in a child of that age, she wrung them. Then, what none of the emotions of the day had drawn from her, neither the run in the wood, nor the weight of the bucket of water, nor even the stern word she had heard from the Thenardiess, she burst into tears. She sobbed. Meanwhile, the traveller arose. What is the matter? he said to the Thenardiess. Don't you see? said the Thenardius, pointing with her finger to the corpus delicti, lying at Cosette's feet. Well, what is that? said the man. That beggar, answered the Thenardius, has dared to touch the children's doll. All this noise about that, said the man. Well, what if she did play with that doll? She has touched it with her dirty hands, continued the Thenardius, with her horrid hands. Here Cosette redoubled her sobs. Be still! cried the Thenardius. The man walked straight to the street door, opened it, and went out. As soon as he had gone, the Thenardius profited by his absence to give Cosette a kick under the table, which made the child shriek. The door opened again, and the man reappeared, holding in his hands the fabulous doll of which we have spoken, and which had been the admiration of all the youngsters of the village since morning. He stood it up before Cosette, saying, Here, this is for you. It is probable that during the time he had been there, more than an hour, in the midst of his reverie, he had caught confused glimpses of this toy shop, lighted up with lamps and candles, so splendidly that it shone through the barroom window like an illumination. Cosette raised her eyes. She saw the man approach her with that doll. She would have seen the sun approach. She heard those astounding words, This is for you. She looked at him, she looked at the doll, then she drew back slowly and went and hid as far as she could under the table in the corner of the room. She wept no more, she cried no more, she had the appearance of no longer daring to breathe. The Thenardias, Eponine and Azelma, were so many statues. Even the drinkers stopped, there was a solemn silence in the whole barroom. The Thenardias, petrified and mute, recommenced her conjectures anew. What is this old fellow? Is he a pauper? Is he a millionaire? Perhaps he's both, that is a robber. The face of the husband Thenardier presented that expressive wrinkle which marks the human countenance whenever the dominant instinct appears in it with all its brutal power. The innkeeper contemplated, by turns, the doll and the traveller. He seemed to be scenting this man as he would have scented a bag of money. This only lasted for a moment. He approached his wife and whispered to her, That machine cost at least thirty francs. No nonsense down in the knees before the man. Coarse natures have this in common with artless natures that they have no transitions. Well, Cosette, said the Thenardius in a voice which was meant to be sweet, was entirely composed of the sour honey of vicious women. Aren't you going to take your doll? Cosette ventured to come out of her hole. My little Cosette, said Thenardier with a caressing air, Monsieur gives you a doll. Take it. It is yours. Cosette looked upon the wonderful doll with a sort of terror. Her face was still flooded with tears, but her eyes began to fill, like the sky in the breaking of the dawn, with strange radiations of joy. What she experienced at that moment was almost like what she would have felt if someone had said to her suddenly, Little girl, you are the Queen of France. It seemed to her that if she touched the doll, thunder would spring forth from it, which was true to some extent, for she thought that the Thenardius would scold and beat her. However, the attraction overcame her. She finally approached and timidly murmured, turning toward the Thenardius, Can I, madame? No expression can describe her look, at once full of despair, dismay, and transport. Good Lord, said the Thenardius, it is yours, since Monsieur gives it to you. Is it true? Is it true, Monsieur? said Cosette. Is the lady for me? The stranger appeared to have his eyes full of tears. He seemed to be at that straight stage of emotion in which one does not speak for fear of weeping. He nodded assent to Cosette and put the hand of the lady in her little hand. 
Cosette withdrew her hand hastily, as if that of the lady burned her, and looked down at the floor. We are compelled to add that, at that instant, she thrust out her tongue enormously. All at once she turned and seized the doll eagerly. I will call her Catherine, said she. It was a strange moment when Cosette's rags met and pressed against the ribbons and the fresh pink muslins of the doll. Madame, said, said she, may I put her in a chair? Yes, my child, answered the Thenardius. It was Eponine and Azelma now who looked upon Cosette with envy. Cosette placed Catherine on a chair, then sat down on the floor before her, and remained motionless without saying a word, in the attitude of contemplation. Why don't you play, Cosette? said the stranger. Oh, I am playing, answered the child. This stranger, this unknown man who seemed like a visit from Providence to Cosette, was at that moment the being which the Thenardius hated more than all else in the world. However, she was compelled to restrain herself. Her emotions were more than she could endure, accustomed as she was to dissimulation, by endeavouring to copy her husband in all her actions. She sent her daughters to bed immediately, then asked the yellow man's permission to send Cosette to bed, who is very tired today, added she, with a motherly air. Cosette went to bed, holding Catherine in her arms. Several hours passed away. The midnight mass was said, the revel was finished, the drinkers had gone, the house was closed, the room was deserted, the fire had gone out, the stranger still remained in the same place and in the same posture. From time to time he changed the elbow on which he rested. That was all, but he had not spoken a word since Cosette was gone. Thénardier moved, coughed, spit, blew his nose and creaked his chair. The man did not stir. Is he asleep? thought Thénardier. The man was not asleep, but nothing could arouse him. Finally Thénardier took off his cap, approached softly, and ventured to say, is monsieur not going to repose? Yes, said the stranger. You are right. Where is your stable? Monsieur, said Thénardier with a smile, I will conduct monsieur. He took the candle. The man took his bundle and his staff. The Thénard and Thénardier led him into a room on the first floor, which was very showy, finished all in mahogany with a high post bedstead and red calico curtains. What is this? said the traveller. It is properly our bridal chamber, said the innkeeper. We occupy another like this, my spouse and I. This is not open more than three times a year. I should have liked the stable as well, said the man bluntly. Thénardier did not appear to hear this not very civil answer. He lighted two entirely new wax candles, which were displayed upon the mantel. A good fire was blazing in the fireplace. When the traveller turned again, the host had disappeared. Thénardier had discreetly taken himself out of the way without daring to say good night, not desiring to treat with a disrespectful cordiality a man whom he proposed to skin royally in the morning. <laughs>